Welcome to the Sports Card Lessons Podcast. I'm your host, Big Ken. Whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on a streaming service, please like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. You'll be notified whenever I drop any new content. Welcome. Thanks for being here. How is everyone doing? Happy Thursday. As I get ready for the first show of many in 2024, I can't help but reflect a little on how I've gotten to this point in the hobby. Uh, I look around my office. I see uh, some success. I see some failure, right? I look at my my PC wall with uh, with all my PC cards in it. Uh, it brings me happiness. I mean, I, absolute happiness, joy to see all these cards. Uh, and And in that success and in that joy, Right. And even in that, in the failure, there was many lessons learned. Um, One card I keep here at my desk all the time, and I've done this uh, for a few years. uh, It just reminds me of of not only uh, a mistake that I made, but also that no matter how much due diligence you do, right? Things sometimes just don't go as expected. So I, I'm gonna and I and and if you've been here since the beginning, if you've seen this card a number of times and you, and you kind of know the background, but I'm still gonna hold it up anyways, right? I'll give you time to uh, to laugh if you haven't seen this card. It is a 2021 Don Russ Mac Jones. It's just the paper version, the rookie card, just a rated rookie. And it is graded a PSA three. And this was part of an order uh, that I sent in. I sent seven of these cards in. Um, I had 25 or 30 of them to choose from. And I went through and I took the best seven cards out. Uh, Four came back PSA 10. Two came back PSA nine and one came back a PSA three. Now there's no reason. I mean, so many people have looked at this card. There's no reason it should have been a three. So somewhere along the line, somebody made a mistake. And, and, you know, that was my first submission to PSA. And at that time, they had just opened up, right? So getting this card graded cost me $150 to grade this card. So you could imagine the price on you know, getting these cards, you know, these seven cards. And in fact, there was, uh, there, it was 10 cards in all, uh, that I sent in, uh, on that order. And the, uh, the other three didn't, neither of those three came back at 10. There were two nines and an eight in those other two cards. And they were also, um, you know, 2021, uh, Don Russ cards, right? So, and at the time, and I in my in my own defense, at the time, you know, one of these cards had just sold the PSA 10 and just sold for three thousand dollars. But the problem was by the time I sent them in and it came back, you know, the cards were only selling at about three hundred dollars. And I thought to myself, well, let me sell two of the tens to make back some of the money, which I did, and I wanted to hold on to a 10. Um in fact, I sold two tens and a nine, and I held a ten, I held a nine, and I held this three on the Mac Jones. And um, another lesson learned there: I should have sold them all when I had the chance when they came back, knowing that um, as soon as better products started to come out, that nobody was going to be interested in buying these cards, right? But bright side, right? Bright side, it's still a pop one. <laughs> it's a pop one. It's the only graded PSA three. It's all mine, right? I get to sit here by my desk, and uh, it's definitely a conversation piece, if nothing else. Um, I talk about building my singles boxes. You know, I have a room full of full of with shelving, just full of boxes of singles. You know, I, I have to say, most were bad investments, but I had fun ripping them. So, I mean, it's it's you know, a little one way, a little the other. You know, it, 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 if I just broke it down to dollars against the card, I'd say terrible investment. But what's the price of my happiness? What was the price of me having 
a lot of fun and a lot of hopes and dreams, right? Ripping these cards, hoping to pull some big cards out. And, you know, I did have some hot packs, some hot boxes. You know, I'm not going to say it was all disaster. But, you know, when I look at these, I say, you know what? Uh, there were some valuable lessons learned there. Um, and, and, and again, another bright side, there's still some value in these cards. I'm building these five row singles boxes. They're still worth something, right? They're these cards. It's not like these cards are not worth anything. They're worth something to somebody and setting up at these shows. I'm going to be putting these cards out and it's not like, like it's the same cards that I've been putting out. Like they're stale cards. These are just fresh cards that are coming out of the closet that I'm like, okay, it's time to build another box. Time to build another box. What do I have? Let's go through it. What's, you know, what's hot, what's not. Um, one little success is I, I purchased a hockey box. Um, it was a two row box full of hockey cards. They were all now they, they weren't expensive cards. They were probably two to seven dollar cards. They were all, you know, Gretzky, Lemieux, Yager, Patrick Waugh, right? It was these guys and they were all, you know, they were all penny sleeved and top loaded when they came out, you know, late eighties, you know, nineties, 2000, you know, that they were all in great shape. I made a really good deal. I, and I figured, you know what, even if I could get a dollar a card for the price I paid on it, I would, you know, double or triple my money on it. And, you know, through that box aside, it's been sitting in there and I pulled it out and I never really went through it. I mean, I, I, when I was buying it, I pulled it out and I was going through a bunch of cards and the person I got it from said, yeah, those are all like all those cards there. This is who's all there. I'm like, okay. You know, uh, after going through, I, I believed them. I trusted them. I took it. So I just pulled that box out, getting ready for a show. I said, you know what? I'm going to throw these all out. It's time. You know, I just try to cash in on that investment. And lo and behold, as I'm going through these cards, moving them from one box to a five row box, I come across you know, probably a dozen or so basketball cards that have some value to them, right? Anywhere from 30 to $150 on these singles, you know, some, some, you know, a Michael Jordan and, and, uh, Kobe Bryant and, um, you know, Charles Barkley, just all these. And I was like, wow, I'm like, so, so, so these cards had value. And I don't know if the person knew they were in there when I got it, but I certainly didn't knew, know they were in there. But now I've just pulled these cards out. I comped them all. So I'm excited. Like all of a sudden this box is really going to, you know, pay off for me. So, so and sometimes you say, oh, this was a bad decision. And, you know, sometimes you say this was a good decision that just got even better. Right. So super excited about that. And, and, and here's the thing, if I would have went through that box when I got it, who knows what the value of those cards would have been at the time, right? Maybe they were probably could have even probably been worth more. Maybe I could be downside saying if I would have sold them when I got the box, it could have been worth even more. But at this point, I'm happy. It's like found money and I'm happy to be able to put them out there. Uh, and, and you know, this, this time of year, right. Basketball starting to get hot. So I'll be happy to have them. Uh, there's other cards that I'm pulling out of there. I I I still have I don't have any idea if they were a good or good or bad investment, right? In particular, going through baseball cards from 2020, 2021, 2022, I ripped a ton, a ton of Bowman Chrome Hobby and Bowman Mega Boxes, right? Top loaded, uh, Penny Sleep, top loaded. You know the refractors, the numbered cards, all the first Bowmans, uh, rookie cards, right? It was COVID entertainment at its best, uh, and for most of us, you know, that's what kind of got us back in, I say most of us, a good amount of us got us back into the hobby, you know, doing this type of thing. But here we are three to four years later, I'm comping and researching these cards. Is it worth putting them out there? Uh, you know, the first Bowman's, the rookie cards, a lot of these guys are still in the minors, just moving through the system. Right. And I'm like all this time later, it, it, it's like watching grass grow. I still don't know if they're going to be a hit, not going to be a hit. If they're going to be good, if they're going to, you know, fade away. Um, you know, so I'm researching these players. I'm seeing who I should grade for this spring. Like who, you know, people that, I, you know, that content that I consume or content that I, you know, I follow online, you know, who do I think is going to be a good investment to grade? Now I said on the last episode, PSA has got, you know, 1499 on, on grading. So it's, 
I, I know it's what five dollars cheaper than what they usually do, but five dollars is five dollars, right? So now I've got a card that you know if it costed me fifteen dollars, fourteen ninety nine to grade, could it be worth thirty, forty, fifty dollars or more? Is it going to be a good investor or not? I hope so. I mean, at least in football, right? We know pretty quick if a player is going to shine or fade away. Um, and that's what it comes down to, right? It comes down to patience and timing. Patience and timing is the real key. And I'll say that again, patience and timing, time being able to time the market is really key in this hobby, especially if you're buying and selling cards. Um, I learned that. I learned some hard lessons early on. I sold, I sold baseball cards of, you know, players who, who, you know, I sold what the current comps were on them. And I felt I sold way too early, probably pennies on the dollar compared to where, what their value is today. Right. I wish I had some of those cards back, but then on the opposite hand, right. I sold players at a perfect time because who even knows where these players are today? They're not playing anywhere or nobody knows anything of them. And you go back and look a couple of these cards up and you're like, Oh man, I, I did a great job selling it. So you know, I, I made some mistakes over here, but I had some wins over here. So, and and I think that that's really been able to help me be more successful in the hobby, right? Because if it was all losses, if I just was making mistake after mistake after mistake, I just would have been like, I'm throwing the towel in. But even for someone who did not have a lot of hobby knowledge, I was still having wins, right? And I kept convincing myself that the more I learn, the more lessons I learn, the more wins I'm going to have and the more fun this is going to be and the you know so many other things and and, and you know and it, and and there was a lot of drive and there was a lot of you know looking for the next W, right? In order to say, okay, I'm moving along. I'm progressing in this and I'm doing better and better. Um, with the hobby, I mean, waiting for the right market conditions and knowing when to buy and sell, right? That's why I'm buying a season ahead. And being able to buy a season ahead, right? You have to start somewhere. You have to start. So even if I started this last year saying, you know, I've learned some lessons. So last year I started in November and December, right? Buying football and say, I'm going to buy this football through January, February, March, maybe even into April, right? But then hold off and then start selling when everybody's buying in June and July, right? With football. So buying a mark, you know, buying the market ahead buying the seasons ahead right and then when the summertime came buying the hockey right why i'm selling the football buying up buying the hockey now i'm starting again i'm starting again with the football here we are we're, we're going in a wild card weekend and these last few weeks i talked about who i'm prospecting on right i'm buying some prospecting comps you know i'm staying away from anyone who's in the playoffs i mean i'm not certainly not going to be out buying a lamar jackson right now or you know anybody that's that's going hot into the playoffs this year but teams that are already out players that are out that i feel if i could find some good value on a card i'll take it if not i can hold because once the Super Bowl, after the Super Bowl hits, you know, nobody's really thinking football. Everybody's full speed into basketball and, and looking forward to baseball, right? So you can get some good deals on football then. And that's, you know, I want to buy when people are selling and sell when people are buying, right? So that's why I'm buying a season ahead. And it also gives me time to assess the market and predict it, right, based on the previous years. And that's how I ended up here right? Just basing it on previous years, seeing what happened two years ago and then doing it, trying to emulate it the following year. And it worked out so well, I'm doing it again. Um, trying to buy, try buying and flipping in season. It, it works for so many people and I would never knock it. To me, it's just a tough game. Um, I don't sell enough outside of the shows for that to work for me. If I did, if I was selling on, on, 
marketplace and Instagram. And I had, you know, I was doing all these, these other uh, daily side deals. Like I know people do, I'm watching them happen and people are sending me pictures of cards that they're picking up every day. Check this out, check that out. I, I, I'm just not doing that every day. I'm selling mostly at the shows, right? So I could buy a card at the show this weekend and then I have to wait two weeks right? To set it up in my show. I could carry it to a show, but now I'm selling it to another dealer who's going to be buying the card at pretty much the same price that I paid for the card, right? So that really doesn't work out to make that kind of a sale, not unless I got a really good deal on it. So, so buying and flipping in season and, and quickly like that, it's tough for me and it's less profitable. In my opinion, for me, it's less profitable. It works for a lot of people. It just doesn't work, work to me work for me, but compared to buying off season and selling months later during the hype, that works for me. Uh, I can sit back, I can watch it. I can watch where, you know, who's on the rise, who's going down. When's the best time to sell somebody. I don't hit it perfect, right? I don't hit it perfect, but on certain players that I'm prospecting on, I pretty much know if I can get those cards sold by August and they're, they're selling at a profit. Um, once we hit September and, and the NFL season starts and I still have cards, now my profit level is going down on those cards because the reality of the player, of how well the player is doing. And if the player goes out the first week and doesn't look that good or, you know, drops a bunch of balls or something like all of a sudden people are like, oh, I'm out on him. Like, you know, next thing you know, the, the prices will be down. So, um, it works for me to buy and sell, you know, just before. Uh, I also do a lot of due diligence, right? I research, I consume content. I, I create, you know, lists of players to chase the reason why I'm chasing them. I, I look for, you know, more than just like, wow, I watched this guy playing. He's got a lot of talent, right? Because you, you could, you could take a Jamar chase and put him on another team with a crappy quarterback and he's not getting any balls thrown to him. Right. And then people will just start to forget about those players. So it becomes a lot of just looking at the dynamics of a team, especially with football, a dynamics of a team, a, a, you know, a, a running back. Does he have a, a great line of scrimmage, right. To run, to, you know, open holes so he can, he can run and look good. I mean, we have, uh, I'm going back. I don't know how many years, but the, the year of Todd Gurley, I remember everybody drafting him, his very first pick in the draft. And, and you know, the, we couldn't get rid of him. We couldn't cut him off our team. He was stuck on our bench. We couldn't trade him anywhere. And the, the, the fantasy software, Yahoo and stuff like that, they wouldn't even, because he was a first round draft, they wouldn't even let you cut this guy. But he had the worst line of scrimmage. They compared him to being, a, you know, driving a Ferrari in L.A. traffic, right? Because he couldn't go anywhere. Because nobody could open a hole for him. So then the next year, everybody's like, "Oh, I ain't. I'm not. I'm not taking him." But people who did the research and knew that that the Rams upgraded their whole line of scrimmage, they brought in new tackles, new guards, right? And the next year, this guy was just running, running at will. He was just an unbelievable running back, right? So it's it's getting that information and knowing like who 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 has the potential of being. And I'm not saying it's guaranteed, but who has the potential, right? Um, and then once you figure that out, right, it becomes the thrill of the chase to go out and get these cards and to get them at the right price and knowing what the right price is, you know, and then the rewards come down the road. But it it, it, it all looks good on paper, but there's a lot of shaking and moving all between that, you know, just a lot of a lot of moving parts in between. Um, you know, we talk about just knowing knowledge, right? Knowledge in a in a in a. And a hobby as dynamic as uh, as this, knowledge is power, right? And it's completely free. The best part about it, the knowledge is free. And you could go online and people will say, I mean, even, even if you're in um, uh, fantasy, right? They call it the lazy man's fantasy, right? And people, they go sign up. Oh, I'm going to sign up. And then what do they do? They click on it and they say, oh, who... who you know, find find somewhere, some site to load all their players in, and it tells them who who to who to start and who not to start. I mean, where's the fun in that? There, there there's absolutely no fun. They, you shouldn't even be if you're doing that. You shouldn't even be playing fantasy football, right? For the guys like me who get into it, right? And 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 every week I'm going through and I'm 
and I'm looking at the waiver wires and, I, and I'm picking people up and I'm dropping people and I'm trying to make trades. I mean, that's what this fantasy is all about. It's supposed to be fun. It's not supposed to be, you're supposed to put some money in and just trying to win at the end of the year. It, it's the whole journey to the end of the year. And every year people are, they're like, wow, Ken, he really did really well on, you know, with fantasy and, you know, a couple of leagues I dominate in. I'm in the top first or second year after year after year. It's just, and, and it's, and it's, just because I'm putting the work in. If next year I decided I'm not going to go doing all that research and all that stuff, I would not be nowhere near where I am. So it, it's for the love of it. And when I get, to, when I get to a point, if I don't love it, if I don't like doing it, I'm not going to, I just won't do it anymore. Right. But I'm having so much fun doing it. By the time the end of the season comes, I'm like, Oh, I'm glad it's over. I need a break. And I say, I don't know about next year because I'm so tired. But then by the time July, August come, I'm all of a sudden I'm pumped. I'm looking forward to it again. So um, uh, back to the knowledge, right? Uh, understanding player trends, market fluctuations, you know, what's becoming, you know, probably the most important thing I think for me, and it's going to be uh, somewhat of my trademark moving forward. And we talked about it a ton of times is just the grading is just buying cards and grading stake, trying to get away from the buying, the grading cards, the graded cards, and just, and just, you know, find cards and grade them and, and, you know, try to find the profit in that, because I think that's, probably has more profit than anything else unless you're unless you're buying in on a guy that nobody's looking at and then you know something everybody else doesn't uh and, and right knowledge brings informed decisions you know people talk about diversifying and i hear this so much now at shows you know, that people say, oh, you know, you got to set your cases up like stocks, right? You need the blue chips, you need the tech, you need the, I mean, it's, uh, everybody's using this same, like if I, if I have a dollar for every time I heard people that referring to uh, their cards as blue chips, right? I, I would need to go set up. It's just, it's unbelievable how many people are talking about that. And, and I pulled up a listener quote here, um, because my PC, I'm not really that diverse in, in what I PC, and I understand that. And then in my cases, too, um, I'm pretty predictable because it's what works for me. It's what I have the most knowledge about. But a listener sent me this quote, and I'm just going to read it. Uh, you know, you need to be diversified. Diversification is key in the sports card hobby, building well-rounded collections and the benefits of not putting all your cards in one basket. I completely understand that. And it works for people. It really does. For people who are well-diversed in a lot of sports that can do all that, it works for them. They know what they're doing. They know the players. They know those markets. Me, I like to stick with what I know, what I'm most comfortable doing. I get out of my comfort zone a little. I just talked a little. I'm going to have some basketball cards, right? But these basketball cards I'm putting out there, I had to research the heck out of them just to know what I'm putting out there. So when people come up and say, oh, that's because there were different variations and these all happen to be refractors. So there's, uh, you know, these particular cards, there was you know, a, a, a cheap version, like the paper version and the refractor. And these are refractors. So when you're looking at them, they're, you know, just knowing the difference and knowing the value, that's very important. So if, if someone comes up now and says, oh, is that the refractor? I can say, yeah. Or, oh, that's you way overpriced. Well, no, no, no. That's the refractor. That's not the, uh, the base version. Right. So this is what I mean. But there are people out there that have all those cards in their case and they can answer those questions. I need to be able to answer those questions. So as I, you know, get cards that I'm going to put in there, I'm going to get as much information about them. So when I'm selling them, I know what I'm selling. Uh, the people in the hobby, networking, right? The sports card community, we're a passionate bunch, aren't we? Um, a lot of importance on networking, attending attending shows, you know, being active, 
going to shows, setting up at shows, being active online, just engaging with fellow collectors, right? Because, and we've said this so many times on the podcast and so many different ways, but the relationships formed within the hobby can be as valuable as the cards themselves. And I think they become even more valuable, right? Um, look, I would never, I would never have been, I would never be where I am here today without my hobby friends and the hobby community. I, I really wouldn't. Um, if I had to go out and do this all on my own, like starting a business, right. And it, you're all on your own and you've got to go out and do it. Um, I probably wouldn't have made it this far in the hobby. I, I, I can't say where I would have been, but I think it was the people and meeting all the people and looking forward to seeing the people and setting up. And I'm not talking about just the people I set up with just other dealers. Right. But I'm talking about even the, 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 the collectors, the people who come walk through the show, the people I'm conversing with, you know, on, on Instagram and through YouTube and through Facebook and, and even messaging, right? Because, you know, we pass our numbers out now and just, you know, just messaging with people now. Uh, I've made so many great friends and so many great relationships in the hobby that it, it is part of my life now, right? You know, I, I, I came for the cards, right? The love of the cards. I stayed for the people, right? The, the relationships that I've made out there and the friends that I made. I became a collector, right? I kind of came, became a collector after that. Uh, I, I was just getting stuff that I thought was cool and I thought that I liked. And it took me a few years to say, okay, this is what I want my PC. This is what makes me happy. These are the cards that I want to go out. I want to chase. I want to find and I want to keep. So I, in essence, I became a collector, right? It was after I came to the hobby, after I came for the cards, stayed for the people, became a collector and now a content creator, right? So all those things, all those things had to happen, right? In order for me to get to here to where I am now. And a lot of lessons learned, you know, a lot of lessons learned. So things we talked about today, right? That I just think is really important in, in, the, in, the, with, in reflecting back just the patience, right? Timing, timing the market, right? And the hobby, timing is everything. Um, the knowledge and the networking. Uh, the cool thing about the hobby is there, you know, there's really no right or wrong way to hobby. It's, it's, you know, it's what makes you happy here. Um, and after all, it is just a hobby, right? And, and if you look up the definition of a hobby, and I'm sure most of you have, and you've heard this before, but the definition of a hobby is an activity done regularly in one's leisure time for pleasure, right? That is the definition of the hobby. And, and we're doing it to what makes us feel good, right? What, what makes us happy. So what makes me happy in the hobby, some, something else makes something, somebody else happy in the hobby. So we all do it just a little bit differently. Uh, this weekend, January 13th, I'll be in Secaucus, New Jersey. I'll be set up at the last show. Uh, if you're down there, uh, definitely come by, visit, say hello. It's been a while. Uh, I missed the last, I want to say the last two last shows. Um, so I haven't been down that way in a while. So looking forward to seeing some people down there. So if you're down there, definitely come by, stop by, say hello and catch up. And again, I mentioned I'm going to be in uh, Atlanta at the end of the month, the 26th to 28th for a culture collision. Really looking forward to that. Um, looking forward to that trip. Looking forward to that show. I want to thank everyone for tuning in. And if you like what you hear, please like, definitely subscribe. And most importantly, tell a friend and spread the word. Until next time, take care of yourselves and everyone around you.